Hi, everyone. It's Jimmy. Welcome back to another week of Stage Door Medium. This week, I'm pinched myself. Like the, We have one of the, the most incredible guests here today. So we have the incomparable Julia Murney. Hi, Julia. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine. I, 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 yeah. I could not be more honored to have you here. And it's funny, somebody was already asking me, they're like, well, can you explain the the title of like, why is this called Stage Door Medium? You are one of the prime examples of why I chose this title for the podcast. Because for me, it was not only to, you know, obviously to, to honor what I do, but it was also for me, the Stage Door experience is that moment where you pinch yourself after because you got to speak with somebody whose work that you really admire. And you are like, one of the prime examples. I mean, I can't tell you just to be able to sit down with you and, and talk with you in a little bit about, about your career and just um, fun fact too, really quick, and then I'll stop gushing. But if you're watching at home, um, Julia Murney has done it all. So she went to Syracuse. Uh, she went to Syracuse for the, for, was it musical theater or, or for act for musical, musical theater? theater. Yeah. She's literally been in countless TV shows off Broadway, um, this show is like branded up here. She was the original Queenie in the Wild Party. She was an Elphaba on the national tour, and then she eventually transferred to Broadway. You made your off-Broadway debut in Lennon. Um, I'd love to start talking first about, I didn't know if you could talk about your training, because one of the questions I get asked all the time is like, um, as a medium, do you train? Did you train? And because I think the misconception is that you're just born with it and you don't have to train, which is, you know, I'll talk in a little bit, but that could not be farther from the truth. So if you're good with it, I would love to, to have you share, you know, your, your training and even when you're in a show and already established your name, like, you know, as Julia Murney, what type of upkeep do you do? Well, you know, it's interesting to me that you asked that because I feel like it's very similar in that you correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know for I, not necessarily a medium, but um, I think there is something, some sort of gift that you were born with. And then it's a matter of whether you can get yourself around the right people who can figure out how to help you manage it and hone it and then utilize it. And it's actually, if that is the case, which is what I'm guessing, not dissimilar to someone who's an actor or a singer or a dancer. Like you... Yes, there are some people who from a very young age, I was not a show kid when I was little, I didn't do shows, I didn't, but you know, there are people who are like, just came tap dancing out of the womb and there was a never any question. And, but I, I ended up, I, I grew up in New York City and um, I went to, how do I tell this shortly? I can't. Okay. Um, so I, I grew up in New York and for fourth and fifth grade, we moved to Los Angeles. And then we came back in sixth grade. So when we came back, some of the kids I'd gone to elementary school were at the junior high that I was going to. Um, and so I sort of, in a very sheep way, like they were all going to do choir. So I was like, okay, me too. Simply because they, they were the five people I knew. Yeah. And uh, Miss Morris, Josephine Morris, in room 137 at IS44 in Manhattan, uh, she changed my life because she... Um, because it wasn't just me. It wasn't like she saw something in me necessarily, but she saw something in all of us. She was that kind of, she was, she was strict. She was funny. She was all of the things. And, um, and that's where I started singing. And so she was the one who sort of honed it in me. And then she knew there's a high school here in the city that's uh, called the Guardia. It's the fame school seems silly but that's what it's based on um and that's where I went to school to high school but she was awesome because she kind of knew a great trick for us for our auditions and the auditions now might be completely different understand you know I went to high school in 1852 but when I went to high school so you audition I was a voice major there and you audition and so she taught made us all learn songs from this book called 24 Italian songs and arias because 
most of the kids just sing a pop song or maybe a theater song. I don't know. But if you walk it, and you have to sing all that stuff at the, at the high school. So if you walk in already singing it, it was such a, an, like a, a check mark. Yeah. None of us had any, we weren't opera singers. We weren't you know, anything. And these weren't, these were songs. You know what I mean? They were just in another language, but they were songs. They were not like, now I'm going to sing at the Met kind yeah. of a thing. But, um, but because of her, she, it was her, and which led me to, to that high school. And, you know, it, it's, it, so it's, it is that sort of similar thing. So I went to that high school and then I went for, for two summers, uh, my freshman and sophomore summers of high school. I went to a theater camp in upstate New York called Stage Door Manor. You went there? And I did. I okay. We really quick. Um, my uh, my best my best friend and I watched the documentary on it, and um, the one part how cold. Oh my gosh! Please, I I hope you know what I'm talking about. The part where do you remember the one girl that was like, when I get home, Daddy says I get headshots. And do you remember the parents that were like? Oh my God, these were like not parents of the year. They're like, frankly, when so-and-so mentioned I, I, their daughter, they're like that she wanted to come to this camp. We were a little surprised because let's admit it. <laughs> she doesn't have oh, any no. talent. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, and I'm like, this girl's going to watch this. Like your parents literally just said she has no talent. And, I do um, not remember that, but maybe because I just blocked it out. Um, yeah, keep going. I'm like, and I wasn't like, again, I was, I went because my parents forced me to go to a camp. Cause they were like, you can't hang out in the city. You have to go to camp this summer. And I did not want to go to camp, but I had already started singing. So they got um, like brochures and stuff from every arts minded camp in the Northeast mm -hmm. and put them all in a hat and picked one and forced me to go there. And I, I didn't know, and you know, squatting and squat and you get up to that camp and that camp, I think this is still the case to this day a lot of those kids are even back then were spit and shine and had managers and had headshots and fancy cars that their parents drove and uh, and i did not have any of that yeah um but uh but when i got to camp against much protestation on my end like very like i hate you i hate you slam um within I, I was there for the first three there, there are three three-week sessions yes for summer and I was there for the first three weeks and I don't know like a week in or something I went into the this is how long ago this was the phone room where you had to wait in line when it was phone time to then call collect or use your parents like AT&T card yep um <laughs> begging to stay for another three weeks because it was just like, oh, I love it here. I want to be here. And, um, and the teachers there, uh, the, I mean, specifically uh, one person who's, who's no longer with us, if he comes to say hello during this, please tell him I love him. And I said, hi. Was that the mentor I asked you about during the reading? Oh, maybe. It's so sad. Like now I'll just tell this to all of the people I told you during the reading, if they're Unfortunately, I've had a lot of people pass over it from my life. And so not everyone was on my brain. You know, I think you, I automatically thought of family just because yeah. that's what that's you where think. we go. That's where our brain yeah. goes. But I it, it very, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember now what you asked about the mentor. You mentioned a male mentor figure who would have been strict, but he would have been very in awe of your talent and your ability. That totally could have been him. But he, you know, he saw something in me. He gave me my first part. What um, was his first name? Michael. And um, so, yeah. And then I graduated from high school and I went to Syracuse. And, um, and that was my, tr like, formal training. Yeah. Did yeah. you find that being at stage door and when you talked about so many of the kids already coming with polish and you were like, I didn't necessarily feel like I had that. So I, I guess two quick questions for you. Did you find that they took to you, took more of a liking to you because you were 
raw material that they could work with? And then also, did you always have that beautiful like vibrato or did that develop more in college? Because I mean, that's, I mean, if you were a symbol in my book, if I were to, if they were to say Julia Murney, I would probably go like vibrato, um, you know? So I, those are my two questions. I, that, that, the, I, I will say working backwards, the vibrato is not something that I like honed, it's just there. It is, and it's taken me a long time to actually come to peace with it because in the same way I have straight hair and I always wish I had curly hair, like you always want what you don't have. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to be able to sing a different way. And I had a few people um, in, in uh, education, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Positions of education, like sort of try and wring it out of me. And, um, and that was tricky because it was just what my voice was doing. So instead of embracing it, and finally like one day, not one day, but like eventually I started to look for and embrace things like, well, Betty Buckley's done okay. Mm -hmm. You know, Carolee Carmelo is still nailing it. Like, and they have were brought it. Like I, like I always hate on American Idol when they're like, you're, it's a little musical theater. I know. Which, and it's not the fact that they say that, it's the way that they say it. And, it's just like, wow, they didn't kill your cat. What do you, what, like, it's one thing to say, your voice seems to lend itself to a more, th but they don't say it like that. They say it with such derision. It was like and when they made the dig about um, the royal family. Remember the boy taking ballet? And she, oh, yeah. she got that very same vibe of, it wasn't that you were equating it to ballet. It was like, there, there was some derision about why wouldn't a boy, I get it, I understand. It's nonsense, it's nonsense but- um, so yeah, the vibrato is just sort of there and I have to work very hard actually, cause it is part of my voice. That's kind of not entirely in my control, uh, to work on keeping it in my control. And the question, the first question was, oh, like the I don't know they took to me or not. Um, because truly I think because I was so raw, I kind of morphed into, that kind of <clears throat> performing in a bit, in, in terms of like, there's a big cabaret that uh, all the kids want to be in, like a cabaret show. And that cabaret is very this. And I definitely did that. Yeah. I mean, when I portrayed Anita in West Side Story, that should never have happened. Um, I, I did not do that. I, I like, I always liked the, um, the 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 book basically i liked the scenes and i liked the characters and then if they got to sing cool yeah and that has that has become more and more so frankly the the older i get the more i'm like unless i have to sing i'm fine and they, right just give me the just give me the book work and we're good yeah. um yeah. the same kind of goes for me because i you know you hear of so many mediums that talk about i feel like in every I feel like the exception to the rule, because so many mediums are like, oh, I've been able to see spirit, you know, um, since I was two years old and they came to me and they told me this and this. I don't, I don't have those experiences. So in a way I'm, I'm grateful for it. Um, you know, that's, that's not my story. And, you know, I feel like so many times when you see the TV shows, they're giving you these examples of, um, of how they had it as a kid. I had inklings of it very much like, like you said, you know, we, I think we're born with natural ability, whether that be playing the piano or being a great athlete. And I would always seem to know when, when things were going to happen. I didn't know. Um, I wasn't exactly sure um, uh, why I was getting that information. I just thought it was coincidental. But how did you get from that to a mentor or to Lilydale or whatever? How yeah, so I, which is funny. So if, if you're watching at home, when I read Julia, she had mentioned that she had been to this little town of Lilydale, which is where I trained. So that was that was a neat. Um, I was read at Lilydale in high school, and I remember the the medium who read me. She was so cool, and uh, she she was like, "Are you on medication right now for for something?" And I'm like, uh, "Yeah." I was like, "I'm on a small dose and antidepressant for anxiety." And she took the words right out of my mouth. I was about to say, but it doesn't feel right. And she was like, that's correct. She was like, you do know that you're gifted and that you're supposed to do this. And at this point, I thought she was wonderful. She was, she was so legit. 
But I also didn't know if this was like the Disney gift shop that I was being ushered through. They're like, well, if you have ability, then like join our like $4,000 class and uh, which it wasn't, but I was a little skeptical. And she had two different mediums told me twice, you're supposed to be doing this. They're like, you're, they're like, we have a symbol for what it means to be a medium and that's you. So I kind of laughed it off, but then I was like, eh. So little by little, you know, I, I think when I, when I arrived back at Neely Delta train, it was very much like, I'm just coming as like raw materials, like teach me. And the um, first time you went to Lilydale, did you just go with friends? Because that's what people do. Yeah, I just went with my mom. I mean, that's why I went to Lilydale. I just went because yeah. it's it's a curiosity. It is. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's documentaries on it. There's yeah. books on it. It's, it's fascinating. So I went there very much. Um, and it's funny now being on the other end of it, and and and, I, and, I, and it's interesting. Yes, having a podcast, it sounds like there's it's there's an entertainment, it, but doing the readings for me, no, like there's there's no entertainment value. It's 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 and so I think when I went there as a participant, I very much went in thinking it was going to be like the game of Mash, where you're like, oh, I'm going to live in a shack, but I'm going to live there with like Britney Spears, and I'm going to be a librarian. And um, it wasn't, you know, it was so moving uh, the way the the way the reading happens, and so you know, to, to flash forward, what, 20 years later to be doing this now is, um, I, I could not have imagined, you know, at the time, but I could, I do think, but I do think they have a very similar track, even though they're very different things because very similar. they're, they're, I, I don't know about myself. Cause that's weird. I can't, but I look at other people that I know or admire and I mean, music is the most evocative thing to me, but I, if I hear someone singing or some, see someone dancing in a particular way I'm, or hear a piece of music, you're like, whatever you want to call it, how can you look at that or hear that and not believe there is something larger than all of us yeah. that is being funneled through this dancer, this violinist, this singer, whatever. This I, call the, I call it the transcend the the transcendence factor, is what I call it. You know, it's it's um, and for it's funny. I mean, not to not to gush about you, but I remember um, when I lived at home with my parents, I had no clue what the Wild Party was, and I, I bought the album at Media Play, which was I don't know if that was a a, a a nationwide franchise, but it was like Fye, and I remember I just thought the artwork was cool, and I was like, oh, like um, to me to this day that album was something of like a transcendent experience because I knew you mind you this was before YouTube this was before bootlegs I mean there are bootlegs of it out there but I didn't know of it at the time yeah. and what was so exciting was that like, I remember it would that album transported me because I knew nothing about the show I just knew the music and I remember and I would fill in the gaps like I would listen to your album like and your songs and try to figure out what's going on here and here and like yeah. um especially at the end, you know, when you don't know who gets shot, if you're just listening to the album of the wild party. And um, so that was very much one of those moments for me to, I will never forget hearing your voice for the first time. Like I remember all the hairs went up on my arm and I just like the, cause it was, your voice is just, it, you know, it's singular, you know, and I mean, not to put you on the spot in a weird way, but I mean, it was, it's, it's just one of those moments that's branded. And I just listened to the wild party again, after I read you, cause I, I haven't listened to it in, in some, in some time now. And um, it's like, when you hear the overture a phantom, you know what I mean? All the hairs stand up, like it did it again. And it was just, it was oh, just well, that's nice. yeah, it was cool. So yeah. can I ask you too, because so once you, I guess really once you're out of college and then you start booking these big shows, What's the type of upkeep that you do? Like, are you kind of like, I'm, I'm out, like I'm out of the woodwork. Like I can kind of monitor myself. Do you still have voice coach? Like, how does that work for you? Um, it is, I think something that is a very specific thing to a very individual uh, thing. What I do or don't do, I think is just what I do or don't do. It's not a, this is what everybody does. Um, I know people who, when they are starring in Broadway shows still have voice lessons once a week. Uh, I'm not one of those people, or I have not up to now been one of those people. I, I reserve the right to, for that to be the next thing, cause it might be. Um, uh, I 
things have sh things shift as you as you age. I mean, when I did Wild Party, I was thirty, and when I did Wicked, I was I don't know thirty seven. No, no, that's right, that's right. I was I was thirty seven, um, and uh, the just the difference the difference between doing those two shows, which are both like big fat hairy things to do um for for long runs i mean i did a vita but i did a vita at sacramento music Cir circus and it's eight shows yeah. bam so you don't get into the part of like i cannot do this one more night like it, you don't quite hit that place um and there's a mental thing to long runs that you you truly cannot train for and you cannot prep for you you just have to figure it out as it as it goes. Um, I mean, the big things, but so, I mean, when I did Wild Party also, that show was written on me during the ent entire developmental period and Wicked was borrowed, if you will. Uh, so I had to kind of fit what I do into what was already established. Um, and there was no part of Wild Party that I didn't feel like I somehow either quite actively put my stamp of approval on or just it was there it was implicit like it was it was mine it was ours it was whatever um and there were always just these basic things like you have to sleep you have to eat like properly and give your it's a muscle you don't roll out of bed and say i think i'll run a marathon this morning you train to run a marathon and for a marathon, you like carb load the night before. And so you've got to give the proper nutrition to what it's asking for. And um, and there are, all, <laughs> there are always people who ruin it. There are always people who are like, I'm good, let's go on stage. You know, they're just like wrecked and, th but they don't sound it. And it's so frustrating because you're like, I want to be that person. I want to just go out and you know, doing, Wicked's the longest run I've done anything. And and I just basically, it was about being at the theater or being on my couch. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of, also we'll have lunch and we'll go out. Like your whole life is about eight, getting to eight o'clock. The first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is you go, ah, just to see what you have. And if you go, ha, then you spend all the, all day like with your sort of tinctures and salves and potions and things. And again, those are different for everybody. Like some people gargle with like crazy cayenne pepper and apple cider vinegar and, and that works great for them. And some people are like, that's just disgusting. And I don't, <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> and so it, it, it's, uh, it's so many things. And then I think the, the people, the artists who are the most, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like disciplined because it's built in our dancers. Because I mean, I did uh, a few years ago, I did this thing uh, called the 24 hour musicals. They also do the 24 hour plays. Oh, yeah. We're literally like, it's a bunch of people. And on the, I don't know, the Sunday night, um, somehow, I don't remember how it all happens, but like you get put into casts and the writers see who their casts are. And people bring in props, just random props. And like people pick a prop and they write it about like this cup. They're yeah. like, okay, purple cup. And um, and you come in, and they write it overnight and the actors come in in the morning and learn it and stage it and perform it off book that night for an audience. Yeah. It's, you will lose a year off your life. But um, <laughs> when I did it, BB Newworth was in uh, the one that I did. And we got in in the morning and we had to get there at like early. It was probably nine or 9.30 AM because it's a full day of whatever. And we're just standing there at one point and, and I saw her do something that made me say, BB, have you already done a bar today? Have you done a ballet bar today already? And she's like, that makes me feel good. I was like, oh my God, I barely got here. And but she, is a beast of dance, you know? And that is the thing that centers her. It's the thing that, I mean, I stretch, I always stretch, but like for her, like for dancers, it's that thing. It's like, it's a thing that just 
and I don't think that ever goes away. Um, I don't like warm up every day, but I warm up certainly when I am going to sing, but I'll also warm up if I'm like teaching for a long day or for some reason, I'm going to be talking a lot. I'll warm up. Yeah. For me, I, it's, I know when you, when you talked about not being able to, to, to drink or something like that. And when you talked about, you have to, you have to have food and you're like, so a couple of things that like, if it, um, I cannot eat before a reading. So for example, I, I am, it is it's five, it's like five, 20 to six at night. I have not eaten yet today because I had a reading at three o'clock. And I know that if I, if I were to try to eat, like, unless I'm eating something really small, it's bad because what will happen is for me, so much of what I do as a medium is I use my body just like a performer to like every fiber of my being. So if I, all of a sudden, just earlier, somebody started tickling my hip and then I'm like, oh, this person broke their hip and they're like, yeah. So I, if I, if my body is digesting food, it, there's a real temptation for me as the medium to go, oh, who had stomach problems? Who had digestive issues? No one. Uh -huh. I, my uh -huh. food is digesting. Or I'm like, who has acid reflux? I do right now because I just mm -hmm. ate something. Well, and interestingly, I find, and again, I think this is different for everybody. I don't tend to eat right prior to yeah. going on stage, but I have to eat in enough time. I mean, A, just because you don't want to be belching up God knows what in your co-star space, but also, um, yeah, because, and it depends on the show. If I'm doing a show where I'm wearing a corset, yeah, I don't really want to eat right prior. Right. There's bathroom issues that you have to take into yeah. account. There's so many like, There's you know, that's, that's the non-glamorous side of theater, the non-glamorous side, like of, of doing readings. Like it's, it's not like, there's a lot of like, like, and the other thing is like, for me, if I have a reading at 11, like I cannot roll out of, like, I'm always up. The dogs have us up early anyway, but I can't roll out of bed at 10, go to the studio and do the, like, I've got to be up by like 738 because my brain has to be alert. Like so much of what I'm up. doing is it's your, it's your warm up. Yeah. It's yeah. my warm up, you know, and, and then the training doesn't really stop. Like I, I always say like, it, it's like going to the gym every day. And for me to train, I mean, my training, my, um, my coach is so does it, their readings, you know, and if I feel like I will feel rusty if I, if I haven't been doing a readings for a while, or if I take a little bit of time off just to focus on other creative outlets, it's getting back into the saddle. And um, I, mean, I think about this, not, I wasn't in a show, but for, for everyone who was in a Broadway show when everything shut down, like whenever they open things back up, it's going to take a minute. Yeah. They can't just be like, cool. Okay, let's go. Like everyone's going to have to go back into rehearsal for not just the actors, but for stage managers, for tech, for all of it. And, um, because we've just been like in weird dormancy. I'm sure there are people who have kept singing or kept moving or in whatever. I, I have not felt like singing until quite recently. Like it's just all felt very strange and weird. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's you, you, again, you don't roll out of bed in the morning and say, I think I'll run a marathon today. Yeah, same. So yeah, that's, that's, Oh, I love talking with you. You're so cool. A um, couple other things that I'd love to talk to you about, because I find it so interesting. So a couple fun things, if you're at home and, and you want to YouTube some, some cool videos of Julia, one of my favorites to watch is, is your performance of people. And what I'm so grateful for is I is that, because I know at this point, like it's, it was interesting. Like when you, I've read it before in an interview where people were calling you like the queen of Broadway, but it's interesting. Like they were calling you that like five years before you made your debut in Lennon. So one of the things that sticks out to me so much, I was watching it today before I, before I um, hopped on the call with you is I love that whoever did the pro shot of the funny girl benefit for the actors fund, mm -hmm. they kept the clip going after you left. And I think one of the most powerful things for me that like makes my hair stand on end is like the amount of the applause that's happening after you leave that stage must've been you know, cause I mean, was, can I ask, was that like one of the, other than the wild party, was that like the next big introduction of Julia Murney to the, to the, to the mainstream? Well, I mean, I guess it just depends. So yes. I mean, I, I had done one big uh, other actors fund benefit um, 
but it wasn't an all-star madness. I mean, there were a bunch of people that you absolutely know in it, but um, it was for the, what was it called? Like the Catastrophic Care Foundation or something. Anyway, um, and they gave me this, I sang How Lucky Can You Get, which is this Kander and Ebb number. And I had dancing boys and the mm -hmm. orchestra was on stage with me. And it was so like, ooh, what's this? This is fun. Oh, I've watched um, it like 50,000 times. Oh. You've seen it. Okay. Uh, so then, <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know if you've seen the rest of that concert. I mean, oh. Kristen, Kristen Chandler with those glitter be and be gay. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. There is like just a lot of talent going on. Um, but Funny Girl was, yeah, the one because they had come up with this concept of we're going to have a different Fanny Bryce in every scene. And um, I actually wasn't originally in it. And, um, but a few, so they had not, assigned everything they just sort of had their corral of ladies and then they were figuring things out and and they started to assign them and then the basically the I don't remember why the other song was still available but Audra McDonald um was filming something at the time in like maybe Philadelphia not in New York and she realized that there was no way she's going to be able to guarantee that she could make the concert so she dropped very kind of close. I'm, I'm going to say like two weeks out or something. Um, and so I got called, maybe it was more than that. I don't know. Seth Rodesky would know. Um, but um, so I, I was brought over to Seth's apartment to sing through of the two songs that were still up for grabs. One was People and the other one was Don't Rain on My Parade. So like the biggies, they <laughs> held off. And I remember my first thought was, oh God, people is so cheeseball. Oh, I don't know if I know how to pull that off. And then Peter Flynn, who directed it, who was remarkable, handed me the scene. Because that song in my brain, I didn't really know the show. I'd certainly seen the movie, but I didn't know it back and forth. Yeah. Um, and I'd never seen the show live. And um, uh, that song in my brain had become like the song in the elevator. You know, it's like, it's gone so, it had crossed so far over into this sort of lounge lizard place yeah. in my brain. And Peter showed me the scene that is woven in the beginning and inside of it. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, oh, I didn't know. Ha, huh, that's on me, bad on me. <laughs> and that made, again, it's what I was talking about before. Like that made me understand it. Yeah. Um, and that it wasn't, it's actually quite gorgeous. That's um, the part about what's in Kentucky, right? The, the yeah, correct. Yeah. That's right. That's right. With and the frankly, horse joke. Thank goodness, um, that's how it went because it also led to Lilius White singing "Don't Rain on My Parade," which is one of the more glorious things you could ask to see. It's truly. <laughs> I will put links to it in the bio because it is you well both of yours. The whole so, concert's I mean, great. I mean, I, that, I have to... you say, the whole concert, yes, Carolee Carmelo, the music that makes me dance. The yeah. whole thing is like, uh, you know, it should be included in like the, you know, the musical theater starter pack of like if you're. I mean, it's just. But and I agree, though. I mean, because those things go, they're one night only, yeah. and it, it's so stressy because you're like, well. <laughs> I got one shot. We'll see what happens. I don't know. And um, I ended up doing three of those big concerts. I did that one. I did chess and I did hair. And um, all of them, like right before I go on stage, I remember this feeling of like, why did I say yes to this? This was such a dumb idea. And in Funny Girl, uh, everyone had like a little um, sort of entrance that they made. And uh, Peter Gallagher, uh, I was... Oh. I was arm linked with Dreamboat Peter Gallagher and we're in the wings <laughs> and we're waiting for our, our time to like sneak on stage behind some ensemble to then make our entrance. And I went, <sighs> and he turned to me and he went, you're going to be fine. And I was like, Peter Gallagher, <laughs> I am going to be fine. <laughs> like he was so smooth and so awesome and, and such a great scene partner to do that scene with. And um, he made it okay. Yeah. He made it okay. 
That's funny because if you're watching at home, so I read Julia. Um, I always take a break in between when I read them and when we when we interview because I'm like I want things to marinate with them a little bit. And I read you last week, and I, I won't I won't lie. I mean, I was very candid with you after. Um, I was like, well. I was like you before you went on stage for funny for funny girl. I was like, oh, it's Julia Murray. And I'm like, like, um, like I literally used to be able to even lip sync your dialogue in between. That's how I knew the Kentucky thing. I was like, what's in Kentucky? And I'm like, what's the matter? Can they do it alone? Like I literally, it's up here. And then you're like, Haha, like it's up here. So um it, it's funny when the camera turned on, like your Peter Gallagher was your dog. Like I saw Pepper on the screen and I'm like, oh, okay. She's human. Like we're gonna have a great time, and it, you know, it it was there. She is the baby. The girl. <laughs> oh, um. So I guess while we're while we're on that note, um, if if it's okay, is there anything because you? Uh, no, no, you had been. Um, is there anything I guess that you feel comfortable sharing about the reading? What was the experience like? Um, anything that stuck out with you? There were a couple of things that occurred, and even something that you just told me, just yeah, today, yeah. that was a. Uh, I don't know what you would call it, like a, a PS. Um, a much needed I, PS. Right, yeah. Because at the, at the end of the reading, you asked if there was anyone else who, and, and that's when I started realizing, not realizing, I knew this, but like not in a depressive way, but I was like, huh, I've had a lot of people die. <laughs> oh, and I didn't write the list down. So I, it didn't, like, I, I, I feel badly that I didn't think of Michael when you asked me about a mentor, because right now he's probably somewhere like, you bitch, you know, <laughs> like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was so concentrated on my grandparents, which who all left so many years ago, you yeah. know, that I'm trying to remember them. And, uh, but, uh, and so I, I had asked you about um, sort of a, a particular, uh, clutch of, of, of people and you and you said they one of them came to you yeah. later and uh those of you watching at home uh today yeah he said you know I, I he Jimmy had like some specifics that I'd given him which allowed him to go online and look something up and he brought up something that was uh several photos and I knew everyone in I knew all the different people in the photos but you specifically pointed to one which made total sense that it would be that person. It could have been any of those people, but it was that person. And that and the makes personality sense. was fun too. Yeah. And it personality. Makes me, for me, the reading, because <clears throat> everyone who's passed on from my life, I feel for me, and it's not about me really, but it is, I guess, like, I feel at peace with it. I, I didn't have any, I know plenty of people who have, you know, you have lingering, it takes a, a long time. And if we had read at a different time, sure. I probably would have had very specific, but right now, um, so it was just nice. Like you told me that my grandmother, my nanny kidder, uh, uh, keeps Pepper, my dog company when I leave, which- That's because I, of, yep. I just loved that because I was like, that's so nice of her. Yeah. And frankly, I'm happy for Pepper, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, things like that. Um, but I mean, I think it's such a, um, it's just as fascinating to watch you manage all that's coming at you while you're trying to read me as it is, and maybe I was watching that more because I wasn't like, please tell me about George. I don't have it. But you know, like, please tell me about George and is he okay? And like, I, I felt very confident that I knew the answer to people being okay yeah. and all of that kind of stuff. And I don't judge someone needing to have that information, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, I can't even, I, I can't, I mean, that is, I always say, I have never run into a spirit on the other side that said, I'm not okay. It, yes. It's never. And I've never had anyone go, hey, it's hot where I am. Like, so I, I so sometimes people are like, well. I, I feel that, that that must come from, to a certain degree, from uh, people who have had loved ones go away from some sort of illness or something where their last, uh, 
memories and acknowledgements of them is of them in pain or drugged up so they're not in pain or whatever mm -hmm. um and uh i would imagine to a degree but i feel like it's also probably a projection of Our are they okay because i'm not okay yes and I'm not that's really what they're saying yeah. but i mean it happens so many times where like if i see heads hitting when a spirit comes through that's always my symbol for the two of you must have fought pretty badly before they passed away. So now I know that you're carrying guilt, you're carrying pain with you. They're never going to say good, let them keep it with them. It's always going to be, please release that because it's not healthy. And I, you know, like, like you said, um, I always say if the greatest read comes from the greatest need. So there are going to be some people like you might know of somebody who went to a medium that was like, oh my God, it was the best thing in the world. They brought through this person, this person, and they validated X, Y, and Z. Most likely at that point in their life, they needed it 100%. And then you might have somebody that's like very open to it, open to the experience like you were, but it almost just feels like a nice warm hug. You're like, okay, these were things that I knew the medium validated, but it, but it wasn't anything that like, you know, um, it wasn't anything that was like, I have to know this in order to how to power forward. Right. So, no, it was more yeah. just like a, oh, that person can't, oh, how nice. Yeah. That's nice. And while I won't go into detail, I mean, the um, you know, somebody, if you're watching at home, she had asked me a question about an incident and, and somebody, if they were there, and I was not picking up on them. And so this leads me to the next, I guess, topic, because if you're watching at home, I always want to make sure that you can walk away having learned something. Because sometimes people, one of the questions I'm asked is, well, I went to a medium and so-and-so didn't come through for me. Do they not want to talk with me? And the answer I will always say is, no, please don't take it that way. One of two things. It could literally mean, um, for example, if it's a recent passing and there's like a lot of grieving, maybe like, let's say you were a distant friend, that person might be spending more time with their mom who's still here in the physical grieving. It's like there's still only one of them on the other side. So they're, they're you know, investing their energy everywhere. So it could be that you just miss them. Um, it also could be, you know, sometimes a medium will say, if I see the out to lunch sign or like room service, you know, um, 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 cleaning, you got it. That's my sign for they're either, um, it, it was either such a recent passing that they're still doing something as what we call life review, which, you know, is a whole nother day where they have to sit, sit back and watch their life through the eyes of everyone else that they've impacted and cared for. Or it means that they have chosen to come back, incarnate again, to start learning more lessons because you know, as lovely as the other side is, there's no challenges over there. We, you know, we're not every, you know, we're, we're good. We're at peace. So if we really want to start to check off more of the things that we didn't accomplish when we were here, we will choose to come back again. So that's why sometimes you'll have a medium that will say, did you last like, and it's happened to me before. And it was, um, I remember, I, I remember crying during the reading and I'm like, did you stop getting signs from your grandfather about five years ago? And she was like, yes. And I'm like, how old is your child? And she's like, five. And so sometimes you will have people that will come back within the family. Not always, but um, I rambled, but where I'm, you go ahead. I'm sorry. And I'll come. No, I was just going to say, uh, is veering off. Like, do you think that personality travels beyond like people who are like, who cannot sit still people who like always need to have something to do. I'm going to clean my house today. I'm going to bugger people who are like, and if they get to wherever, and because you just use the phrase, there are no challenges. Yeah. If there's something like, like, is that where haunting comes from? Great, great question. So um, I, uh, it's interesting. Our personality goes with us, but it's only as good as, it's only useful when the medium's trying to read it. So great question. If somebody was, um, for example, a busybody, like recently somebody came through during a reading and they were like inspecting every part of my office with like a glove, checking for dirt, checking for, so I was like, were, were they like that on the, um, when they were here? And they're like, oh God, they were like super OCD. And I'm like, they were like, they would have flourished during COVID because they were so hygienic to begin with. So that doesn't mean that they're cleaning on the other side all the time. They, you know, the, the, the personality quirks are something that for the most part, we do shed um, when we kind of go back, you know, um, on the other side. However, the medium is going to pick up on it because I remember when I first started reading, sometimes I would see people dragging their feet. And when I first started getting that, I went, oh, 
they don't, they don't want to talk to me. And I was reading the symbol wrong. I was younger. That symbol just means that when we were here, we might have been devout um, Roman Catholic, or which, you know, I was raised Roman Catholic, or we might have been a devout um, this faith or, or this faith, and we didn't, we didn't want to communicate with a medium. But on the other side, we are now. So if I, now I know that's what that symbol means. But, um, you know, there were, there were definitely times where I've misread it. And like when I read you, I think my brain was so fried because we chatted for a while. So when I got home, I showered. And when I was driving home in the car, that person that we spoke about was like, why didn't you get me? Why didn't you bring me through? And they were like sassing me. And so, you know, as we spoke about, she's been coming through the entire week going, can you please make sure that you bring this up because I felt like there were other people that very much needed to find closure and peace from this. And so I did my homework today because, you know, that's after you do the reading. Sure. If you want to look up an event that happened or, or something, um, cause that's also my way of checking my radar. Like, did I read this right? Did I understand it? And I pulled up the photo and sure enough, I, there were like what 40, 40 something people in that photo. And I was like, is this like to get that one person out of 40 is highly unlikely, you know, statistically. And she kept going, that's me. That's me. And she was kind of pissed that her face was like buried underneath the other ones, but yes, that's good. you know, so, um, well, look, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I do have a couple of fun questions for you um, to, Oh, that's the other cool thing that I have to share with you. Uh, if you're watching at home, cause this is just, it's too good. Um, and it's nothing personal, I, I promise. But I remember when I read you, I brought up something about a uh, renovation because when you're watching, uh, so as a medium, when they remember most of the time, I only have like a half hour to 45 minutes with the client that I'm reading. So spirit, my general term for whoever wants to speak that are highest and best, they're going to speak to us in many different ways. So one of my strengths I would like to think is because I'm so well-versed in pop culture, they can show me a quick snippet of a movie. They'll show me um, a character from a TV show. And that in a way instantly downloads all I need to know about the person. So if you're watching at home, I um, had this clear audience moment where clear hearing, and I heard this clear as day, I have it on the soundboard. So get ready. Tear down that bitch of a bearing wall and put a window where it ought to be. So if you're like, what is that at home? You're you're maybe too young. Then how dare you? And how dare you? Mommy dearest. So the, you know, Joan Crawford in the film is complaining that she wants a wall knocked down. Then they showed me um, your kitchen. And I asked, I was like, are you having something renovated? And you're like, no. And I'm like, did you? And then we had talked about that. So um I think it was just so like, I'm like, what a gift this was to be given Faye Dunaway as Joan Crawford in a reading with Julia Murney. It was like gay icon upon icon upon icon. It sort of scans on so many levels. <laughs> it was like the, the spiritual version of like Diva's Live, um, except it was like deceased Diva, um, uh, which is, uh, so anyway, um, so that's kind of how it works. If you're watching at home and you're like, well, how do they get things? That's just one little baby example of, of how we of how we read. If you were a ghost and you were stuck in a theater for all of eternity and you could only watch the same show nightly, what musical would you pick? Dream Girls. Dream Girls. I had pegged you as a gypsy girl personally. I've Dream done gypsy. I know you have. I, I did gypsy at summer camp, which is inappropriate. And I played Mazeppa, which is really inappropriate. And then I played Mama Rose uh, two years ago, I guess. Something like that. At the Cape, uh, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, dream girls. Dream girls. If you could go back, time travel, and originate a role that has now earned an actress a lot of um, accolades, what show would it be? What part? Dot in Sunday in the Park with George. Good choice. Excellent choice. When people look back on Julia Murney one day, hundreds of years later, as a human being and as a performer, what do you hope people will say about you? As a human and as an artist? I would say I actually hope that it's, it's the same thing. I hope that they, I'm thought of as someone who was generous with, as a human, with their time, with their uh, friendship, with their advice, with their, um, 
sort of entertainment. And as, as an actress, generous on stage as someone to you know, play music with or do scenes with or whatever. And, and then, you know, sort of bring it all the way around to why you named this, what you named it, like at a stage door. Yeah. Stage dooring wasn't a thing for me when I was a kid. I didn't, I, I never did that. And, um, but certainly uh, Wicked beyond any other show that I've been in, you know, the stage door of Wicked is a special thing and it's not part of our job. And people forget that. Yes, they do. Um, and um, they sometimes- at home, it is not part of their job. They do it- For it, we are exhausted. And, um, but I felt like, I felt such a great responsibility, not because I thought people wanted to meet me, but because people wanted to meet the green girl they just watched for two and a half hours plus. Um, and, uh, and there were certainly all kinds of things that would happen at the stage door. You'd be like, you don't really realize what you're saying. You think that's a compliment and that's actually not a compliment, sir. Um, or parents like shoving their little children like, go, go say hello, say hello. Mind you, I was blonde at the time. So I'm walking out, I look nothing yeah. like what I just looked like. And I would always bend down, I would go, do you know who I am? And almost always they would go. And I would say, look, <laughs> because I would always have green here or in my ears. I was like, do you see? And then they would, re but just like, it disturbed me that the parents are shoving them in front of a stranger. Um, but for all of those, there's also just now in retrospect, all these years later, people who come to me and, and they, or write me on social media or whatever and say, cause first Elphaba is a big deal in Wicked World. Um, like you were my first Elfie or I met you at the stage store or I wrote you and you wrote me back and blah, blah, blah. And I, I it makes me feel such a state of satisfaction that I gave someone a memory I didn't necessarily know I was doing. And I will share, I guess, that story really quick. So, and it's funny, I, I, I mentioned it to a friend and you did the exact same for him. I guess he mailed you a photo of the two of you meeting and, um, you know, you, you had signed it and sent him back a kind note. And so this idea of you talking about, you know, generosity. So at, at home, if you're watching, you know, when I, I thought I was, I was hoping that I was going to catch you as Alphaba before you left. And I sent you a note because I just bought your CD at Barnes and Noble. And they're like, who is Julia Murney? I was like, Ugh. I was like, like, I was like idiots. And I was like, it's in this section. And I remember I bought the CD and I was like, like, it's like it's a lack of culture here. And, um, I remember I wrote you and I was like, uh, I am in love with your album. And I remember I'd asked you, I was like, I didn't know how backstage tours worked at Wicked. And I'd ask you some questions about it, never thinking that I was going to hear back. And, you know, this letter comes with the uh, autographed, you know, five by seven, you, you with those hands like this. And uh, um, it is something that stuck, has stuck with me to this day. And I, I will never, it was like when I, I met Patty Lapone when she was in, I was in high school and um, we were doing a Vita and she came through Buffalo and she agreed to meet with um, the four leads of our show. And she, Julia, she greeted every family member of hers that was in town before she greeted us. And then she went, oh, they're gone. Let's sit. And she stayed with us for like 45 minutes. Like, like the theater had to like give her the boot. And it's <laughs> generosity that has always stuck with me. I will never forget it. And that's, you know, and it's, I do it in my line of work too. Like, I'm never going to go up oh, 30 minutes. Like that's time. I'm like, no, like, let's keep talking, you know, like, it, and it's just, and so I, I agree. I hope. Um, and yeah. I hope, I also hope, frankly, that the people that I've seen, I mean, I remember coming out of the stage for once at Wicked and I was, I was triple exhausted. And so I just, the, an announcement was made where I basically said, you guys, here's, cause it happened to be a very crowded stage door that night. I was like, here's, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to come down the line. I'm going to sign everything. Uh, I can't stop for pictures. You can take all the pictures you want, but I can't pose for pictures because I just, I have to get home. And I saw someone out of the corner of my eye be like, Ugh. and I wanted to go, you know what? 
there's a back door and I could have walked out of that, but I didn't, I didn't. So I would also hope that that young man is now older and now understands why that wasn't, that was me trying to be as generous as I could be inside of that moment. It doesn't mean that I can always with anyone who comes to me be like, let's sit down, we'll have lunch, we'll talk about your life. Like, but to whatever degree I have, I try to be generous. And I was even generous to him because I did not embarrass him in front of the entire line, which I really wanted to do. <laughs> I ever remember you as one of the kindest and most generous. So I want to thank you so much for, for being my guest. And um, this was such an honor to talk with you. So oh, it's my pleasure. thank you. Well, you guys at home, I will send some, I will put up some of my links of my favorite, favorite, favorite Julia Murney performances, her story about October, um, mm-hmm. and some, uh, the Spice Channel. And um, I will check IMDb because I'm convinced that you're in Halloween, but it's clearly not. So I'm going to um, do what Where I can. Where have you been one of those Halloween movies? That'd be so baller, but no, not me. Well, I will pull it up. I'll send you the clip of why I thought it was you, but. Yeah. Everyone at home, thank you for watching another episode of Stage Door Medium. I will see you next week. Good night.